What up all you amazing people? My name is Matt Alonzo. I am a filmmaker, creative, more specifically a director and editor. And I've been in the industry as a professional for a little over 10 years now. Most notable work would be my music videos and uh, short form content. What up YouTubes? My filmmaking journey began at a very young age. My father bought a VHS camera. Seeing myself on TV and seeing the way my parents would laugh and smile and just seeing the emotions that the camera would evoke in people mesmerized me and it captured my imagination. And I began you know, using the camera. By the time I got into high school, it was filmmaking and just creating. I didn't really take it seriously though. Uh, it was just something that was innate to me and I got fascinated with the editing process and being able to tell stories with images you know was something that was addicting to me and something I was just uh, enamored with. In the beginning my inspiration came from being the best filmmaker I possibly could with whatever equipment was in front of me. As a young filmmaker I didn't really have a lot of the things that filmmakers would use to shoot movies or shorts or commercials uh, shoot content with so I had to improvise. I had a an innate ability to replicate things that I saw. So if I saw a camera, you know, move across the screen um, smoothly, I didn't know exactly what was being used. I was 10 or 12 years old, but I would replicate that motion with the skateboard or find something that would re recreate that. Having to like work with whatever I had inspired me and motivated me like nothing else because I learned early on that the equipment and the tools that people have don't really do anything if you don't have uh, the intangibles as a filmmaker and, and the ability to tell a story and understand camera movements and edits and beats. You know, as I first started coming out to LA and I, I did my first projects, you know, the budgets were um, micro budgets compared to what people had at the time for comparable work. And our work stood right there with them and that instilled a lot of pride. And that's what, that's what really motivated me um, to, to be the best with whatever I had. And, and still to this day, I, I don't, I don't need a certain equipment to, um, to create something. And, I, and like, I, it fuels me. It fuels me when people tell me I can't create something of substance with a non-red or a non-Alexa or you know, XYZ lighting or whatever, a crane, it's, it's complete nonsense. So um, being able to disprove them and create something with what I have um, definitely inspires me. And telling stories, I think, is, is kind of where the narrative went as far as inspiration and motivation, you know, being able to still manipulate images and, and, and visuals to create content that would emotionally impact the viewer and change their view or perception or emotional state from before they saw the piece and, and have a cathartic release of some sort or, or learn a lesson uh, is really what motivates and inspires me. Um, and that's why feature films has always been the goal and uh, you know, that's where I wanna where I wanna be. My professional start as a filmmaker came in college. And while I was at film school, I just took everything that was coming at me uh, very seriously. So I did a lot of internships. One of the internships that I did was for a record company. And when that internship ended, they put me on staff. So before I even graduated, I had paid work. Essentially when I graduated, they released all the staff and, and brought me on as pretty much the, the head of video production. And that was, kind of how I got my start as far as, you know, paid work. Shortly after that, I ended up leaving that company one day. I just, uh, I kind of had a mental breakdown. I was wearing a suit and tie and I was very constricted to uh, certain content that I had to create. And the, the CEO would come sit next to me for most of the day and just tell me what to edit and stuff like that. Financially, it was an amazing opportunity. It was an amazing job, but um, it creatively and, you know, for my soul, it just, as an artist, there was nothing fulfilling there. So I ended up just quitting and I had uh, no money saved. It was more of an impulse um, choice decision. So I had to go you know, to Craigslist and, and word of mouth to really get my, my name out there. You know, I hadn't done anything of substance besides the, the work that I'd created with this record company. And actually none of that work ever saw the light of day. So you know, financially it was great, but I, had really, I hadn't progressed anywhere from the day that I graduated as far as getting my name out there. 
I got an opportunity from my roommate, shout out to Royal Honor, and he, he asked me, hey, do you wanna go to San Diego and shoot this concert for 200 bucks? And I'm like, okay, sure, you know, I have nothing else to do, so <laughs> we loaded up a couple, a couple of my friends and uh, a couple mini DV cams, and we showed up to the, to, to the venue, it was House of Blues in San Diego, and Little, Little Wayne's name was on the marquee. I ended up shooting the concert and taking that footage home and cutting it up that night, putting it out on YouTube. This is back in 2008, so YouTube had just kind of, was just getting its wheel spinning. And the next day, that video had, you know, a million views and was on every blog and uh, MTV, VH1, any, anything that was music related, it was, it was on there. And I labeled it a, a you know, Little Wayne Gossip official music video. And back then, no one said official music video unless it was an official music video. So people took it as the official music video. And that really got my name out, obviously, overnight. And then I, um, I got a message on my YouTube from uh, DJ Ski, who I had known from uh, you know, following Game. And he was Game's DJ, so I knew he had connects. He was starting to document his, his life, essentially, and, and he called it Ski TV. And he asked if I would want to come aboard. And we teamed up and uh, became a partner in, in Ski TV. And I think within two months, I was shooting Cardinal Official featuring the clips and game featuring Travis Barker, Dope Boys, uh, Soldier Boys turned my swag on, all within six months of posting the Lil Wayne Gossip official music video on YouTube. So that's kind of how I got my actual start. Right now, I don't know if film school is the best option financially for young filmmakers. Even when I was going to school, it was a tremendous amount of money. And, and when you graduate, you're in debt and have massive loans. Um, but, you know, for me, this was an investment in my career, investment in my future, and I took it as such. And so I, I got a lot out of film school. Before I went to film school, I was just a little snotty-nosed filmmaker with a, you know, a one-chip, you know, mini DV cam who thought, you know, shooting weddings was, was a filmmaker. Uh, not that it's not, but as far as what I learned and, and the progression that I had in those three years, uh, is monumental. I definitely can say I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't go to film school because all the things that I learned I didn't know and I wouldn't have learned on set. I, I would have never even taken the two hour ride out to LA to look for an apartment to start my journey as a filmmaker. I would have just worked a nine to five. So, you know, crossing that threshold really put filmmaker in my head. And at that point, the day that I signed to go to film school was the day that I became a filmmaker in my mind. You're able to learn the process, learn the skill, learn the trade without having all life's pressures on you, which for me was worth the amount of money. Those are the, those are the, the upsides. And like I said, the downsides is just financially being responsible for that money. But if you can find you know, a, a junior college or a course or some of these other opportunities now that they have, you don't actually need the degree. You just need the education and you need the social skills that, that come with that. People say, oh, I can watch YouTube tutorials and all these things, it's great, but you're sitting at home alone. You're not interacting. You're not learning the hierarchy of set. You're not learning how to properly communicate. You might think you have a great communication style, but you don't know until you're working or guiding 15 people. You can either jump right into the field, but like I said, a lot of the things that, that I learned in film school as far as blocking actors and, and color schemes and just visual storytelling and, and cinematic language and being able to translate emotions with visuals, camera movements, angles, you don't necessarily learn on set because the director, the, the, you know, the production has already made those choices long before they come on set. And they're not gonna sit there and explain every angle to you. If you're gonna go out and buy $100,000 or $50,000 or even $20,000 worth of equipment, scratch that and take that $20,000 and put it into your education, at least $10,000 and, and spend $10,000 on equipment. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So if you're gonna spend any money on equipment, I say rethink that and at least put half of that money into your education and, and go into some actual, you know, camp or seminars or something where you're around other creatives and you can see how the process works. Um, so that's what I say about that. Filmmaking and patience go hand in hand. Patience and filmmaking are essentially one and the same to me anyways. Uh, the process is hurry up and wait for majority, if not all, of the processes when it comes to filmmaking, even down to writing the creative, um, interacting with 
potential clients or clients on set. You have talent who's late. You have things that go uh, astray or awry and uh, technical difficulties. You know, where you're waiting on something or someone. You know, a lot of times you're, you're waiting and having the ability to be patient and understand, okay, this is an, an opportunity for me to do something else or to enjoy the moment um, is essential, uh, not only to filmmaking, but just to life in general, you know? You, know you, you can't force it, you know? And you have to be able to just trust the process and just go with the flow. So patience, I learned as somebody who wasn't very patient, uh, is mandatory. Um, and then if you think about it, even from a post-production standpoint, you know, you sit in a chair for 24, 48, 72 hours, or, you know, sometimes weeks at, at a time, depending on, on, on the, the length of the content, you know, that's, that's two or three weeks to create a project. On top of pre-production and production, you're talking like two, three months, you know, and then a, a movie, you're talking years. So, you know, the, I want to create something, I want it to be tomorrow is, is um, out the door. Um, yeah, you can, you know, you have those projects and opportunities, but as far as, you know, just filmmaking in general, and even when it comes to your career, it's not going to be overnight success. It's going to be, you know, a marathon, like Nipsey would say. It's, it's small victories every day, you know, just putting one brick on top of the other and eventually looking up and seeing, seeing the wall, you know. But if you're not able to put one brick at a time and, and you're in a rush and you're trying to build it, it's just going to crumble. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and that's filmmaking. It's filmmaking from, like I said, the set all the way to, to your career. Um, and dealing with talent and everything. So patience, um, if you don't have it now, learn it. My advice for young videographers or young filmmakers who are starting out, study your craft. Don't even worry about cameras, equipment, what you don't have, what you do have, what they have. All that is nonsense and all it really is is excuses. So you can constantly make excuses as to why your work isn't up to par but essentially it comes down to how well you know your craft. And I take myself and my career as, um, as an example of this. And like I said, I didn't have all the things that people um, had and I was able to create stuff that was on their level, if not better. And you guys have the same opportunity, uh, if not more so now than, than I did back then with the, you know, the, the relevance of, of equipment. So be the best filmmaker you possibly can. Study your craft, learn, Composition. Learn visual storytelling. Learn cinematic language. Learn why a uh, you know a, a high shot is different than a low shot, and what that emotionally conveys to your audience. Learn things like editing, pacing, and um, you know eye trace and uh, color schemes and, and color psychology. All these things that do not require anything other than a you know your effort. Really, really do the best you can with all those things. And I'm telling you, your filmmaking career will go farther than somebody who has all the best equipment in the world. Um, I know a lot of people get caught up with all these Instagram pictures and all this crazy equipment, but it really means nothing if you don't have the, these intangibles. You don't understand the fundamentals of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to convey and the ability to tell stories because every visual is a story. And another thing is to understand that uh, it, it's a process and don't get discouraged when things don't go the way that you envision them. Even if you do everything right, even if you do every single step, it may not turn out the way that it's supposed to, that's life. And more so when you're an artist because it is just ups and downs, roller coasters. That's why we get into this. I mean, we're, as artists, we're people on the edge, you know? All my crew, I met them, there was five of them living in a, a studio apartment you know, and they were shooting free videos just for, to get their name out and, um, but they worked their way. They understood that, hey, this is just a, a, a downtime. It's going to, it's going to change, you know, and I'm going to change that narrative. And, and they were able to see, to see farther than, you know, that day or that present moment. And so that's one thing that I would tell you on filmmakers, just don't give up, just, just persevere. How to learn the art of filmmaking, the easiest and most efficient way Grab a camera, grab your cell phone, grab anything that you possibly can to be able to capture uh, visuals and start creating, start learning the fundamentals and start learning what style suits you, really. How do you learn how to play basketball? Do you, do you watch all these tutorials on how to dribble the ball? No, you go and grab a ball and start dribbling. You know, you can sit at home and watch as many YouTube tutorials and as many Q and A's with people, successful directors but essentially it still comes down to you grabbing a camera and actually putting any sort of knowledge 
into action. And you'll be surprised on how much you will learn just creating. And it can be anything. What I used to do when I was younger was I'd write little raps and then I would have my friends, yo, yo, get on the song with me. And then I'd take myself off and I'd go shoot their music video, essentially. All the things that I learned about storytelling and, um, and all the trial and error prepared me for you know, a life as a filmmaker. And I was able to get all the kinks and, and things out and learn a lot before I even you know, took filmmaking as a career seriously. So um, if, if you even th are thinking about filmmaking as a career, I would say the best thing you could possibly do is start creating. Well, the first camera that really made me relevant in the industry is this one here which is a uh, artifact uh, these days. This is a Panasonic DVX, one of the first uh, 24 frame cameras that they released. Three chip camera. Most cameras at the time were one chip, which were very consumer based. This was a prosumer camera. Essentially was built to replicate film. Uh, this is what I shot the Lil Wayne Gossip concert on. And this is what really kind of started my career, 720 by 480. Love this thing. As my career progressed, actually the first uh, real professional music videos that I shot were on a red one. I was one of the first filmmakers, directors to shoot a music video on the red. All of my buddies who lived in one studio apartment uh, actually worked at a rental house and they had one of the only reds in LA and we were able to rent it out for a relatively good rate and that's why we were able to use that camera. And, um, and no one had really used it before and we were able to kind of set the standard with that camera and really started to hone my um, visual style with that camera. Then Canon released the 5D and the 7D, which once again, I was one of the first directors to shoot a music video on the 5D. Fly Like a G6 was a huge music video and I shot it on a 5D. And then I used the 5D and the 7D essentially every other shoot, depending on the budget for the next three to four years. It was either that or red, we alternated. Those were the cameras that I used for majority of the beginning of my career. And with those cameras, we were really able to usher in the digital revolution. And we were kind of the, the front runners, if you will, of, of that revolution. And while people were still shooting on film, uh, we were the ones running around with a red one, which was untested at the time. And, and you know, Canon 5Ds, which people thought were consumer cameras. And we were able to you know, um, produce and put out professional work videos that went number one around the country, I shot on those cameras and pretty much changed the, the whole landscape of filmmaking, essentially. I've been asked this question almost every single day for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years. What's my favorite camera? What's my favorite lenses? What do I use? And the answer has never changed. My favorite is my ability to use anything that is able to capture visuals and create content that is comparable to somebody with, you know, the most revolutionary brand new equipment. Um, I think equipment changes so fast that you have to be able to adapt and I really don't buy something that's going to be out of style or essentially irrelevant, you know, within a year. I don't believe in that. I, I rent my equipment for all my, my shoots. It's a few hundred dollars. You know, you're always able to, to get the new and new and improved and, and kind of um, be flexible with whatever you're given. Um, and, and that's what I think is really missing right now. People get so caught up in all these dimensions and, and, and stats and specs and they completely lose the, the whole point of creating films which is storytelling and the ability to you know evoke emotions in your audience it has very little to do with what equipment you're using. Every project's going to be different as far as what camera you want to use and aesthetically it might be better to use an Alexa for more of a film look. Um, another project you want it to have a more digital look or maybe you're doing green screen where the red would be preferable. And there might be a, a project where you're going to have to run and gun and move around. Neither of those cameras are, are very resourceful when it comes to that. So a, a Sony would be the best option or maybe a Blackmagic. I do like anamorphic lenses. Right now though it's really tough to use those because of you know where the media is being displayed at. Most people it's going to be their phone and a lot of the times it's going to be vertically. So if you're using anamorphic your content is one eighth of the screen. So times are changing and, and my favorites are really kind of irrelevant. I really just uh, have a favorite for each project and uh, each camera speaks a different language. So it's really about the story and the language that you want to you want to use for that particular project. So I think that you should really just learn your craft and learn the cameras as you go, learn the evolution and, and, 
and start with whatever it is that you can afford. What lens do I use the most? Whatever lens fits the best for creating or evoking that emotion. If I want to do something really impactful and powerful, then I'll use a close-up. I'll, I'll use a, a, a long focal length and be able to create some depth with the lens itself, as opposed to a wide shot where the impact is not felt. Uh, so I think lens choice, as far as my favorite, is really dependent on what the project is, what's the story that's being told, and what emotion you're trying to evoke in that particular shot. Um, when it comes to flexibility, the fastest zoom lens you can possibly find would be the most resourceful lens to use. And I, I love using those lenses. Um, obviously, when you, you get to the higher productions, you get fixed lenses, which at times slows you down tremendously. So, you know, I do, I do like zoom lenses, which I think would be my favorite. I, I don't know if I necessarily use it the most, but I guess when, I, when it comes to using a lens the most, uh, a long focal length and a very fast lens when it comes to, to speed. Uh, 85, like a 1.8 one or a 1.8 and a 3.5, somewhere in between there. And 100, even 100, 150, a 300 would be awesome as well. Just the depth that it creates and, and, and how everything goes out of focus, for those who don't understand depth, behind whatever it is that you're focusing in, tells a story already and you're able to just hone the audience's attention. And I, I really like playing with, with that lens. But I mean, at the same time, I love using a, a wide lens on a gimbal and being able to float around and, and tell the story that way. So I, it's, it's kind of just relevant to whatever it is that you're doing at the time. As you progress in your filmmaking career, you really understand there's no set answer for any question. So when it comes to editing a music video, how long does it take? It's taken anywhere from one night. The first video that I did for Interscope, which was game featuring Travis Barker, I took it home that night and I had it on Jimmy Iovine's desk the next morning. And then there's another video that took two months, the Hobson video for instance. It took you know two months or three months to get everything in order and, and put together. So there's no real set time. What I do like to do though with my clients is, is set a two week timeline so that I get a week, seven days to, to do the initial edit, a couple days to do changes from there, and then you know three or four days to online and color the project. So I do communicate that up, up front. And, um, sometimes I take an extra week on the back end, so three weeks. That's usually what the process and I like to take. I don't like to do these turnarounds overnight anymore. It doesn't make really any sense. You just invested weeks and days and hours, so why are you gonna just rush something in the back end? Fast editing, fast, I, I don't know what fast editing is, to be honest. If you wanna edit faster, invest more time in your pre-production. Spend the time to create a shot list of exactly what you want and only shoot those particular shots on set that day. Don't just go rogue and shoot everything that you see and then have all this footage and, and try to put it together overnight. So if you wanna be faster in editing, use everything you possibly can, storyboards if you want. Essentially, if you do all those things, then you walk away with the video almost already cut. The editing process is extremely, extremely expedited. But as far as taking you know, a bunch of footage that wasn't storyboarded or shot thought through and finding some techniques to rush it. Uh, I don't know any of those, you know. The, the, for me, I started as an editor. I've been editing since I was very young. You know, I used to connect two VCRs and edit my, my little short films that way. And editing has always been the art and the part of the process that has completely intrigued me um, and challenged me and uh, pushed me to depths farther than I ever knew uh, humanly possible. But it's the part of the process that you're able to really tell the story. Editing is humongous in terms of the overall feeling and aesthetic of your, of your piece. And so I take that process very seriously and uh, I, I go through all my footage. I spend time to organize, uh, create bins, and really I treat the process the same as if I'm editing at a post house. I do the process every single time the same so that when I do have a huge client, I'm not trying to like learn the process. People are like, oh, why? It's just a video that's going on YouTube. You don't need to organize and do all this stuff. Okay, well, when are you gonna learn then? When you have $200,000 on your, on your head and now you have clients who need you to perform in a certain way and you've never practiced or rehearsed these things? It doesn't make any sense to me logically when you can do it every single day and by the time you get that client, it's seamless. So if you take the editing process the same as you take your preparation for it, the shooting is easy, that's the fun part. You know, so it's, it's these two sides that, that people uh, seem to want to cheat on. So I, I don't know any, any 
editing, faster editing techniques, I am not the guy to ask, that's for sure. If anything, I'll teach you some slower editing techniques and I'll teach you how to organize all your footage and I'll teach you how to, um, to, to comb and, and, and actually go through every single frame that you've shot. You've spent all this time, you've already invested not only the client's money, but your time, your preparation. A lot of times as artists, our hearts, <laughs> our minds into this footage. So why are you just gonna like, why? Like, why cheat the process? Why cheat yourself, cheat your client? You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. So cinematic editing techniques. What cinematic editing techniques can I? A great book is Walter Murch in the Blink of an Eye. He's a huge editor. He's edited probably five or 10 of your favorite films. And he has a few fundamentals within that book that really tell you what you should be editing on. And that's obviously cinematic because he's, he's a feature film editor and he understands story, emotion, and, and how editing ties all that together. His first couple of rules, the first thing that you should always do is cut on story, always cut for story. Um, then there's you know rhythm, eye trace. As far as explaining those to you right now, it's gonna, it'll take way too long, so I think you should invest a little bit into yourself, and if you're an editor, definitely check out that book, Walter Murch in the Blink of an Eye. You can actually just look up Walter Murch Principles of Editing, and you'll see um, some of his his techniques and his philosophies behind um, why each cut is made. So he's definitely, he's kind of the, uh, the godfather of, of editing. Why do I use manual focus? Because I like the ability to use focus as a tool for storytelling. I like the ability to rack focus and not have to rehearse and time it out with somebody. And I just, it's such a slow process that way and it doesn't, it doesn't have the same appeal to me as opposed to grabbing the camera and just and creating something and, and, and capturing it multiple times and, and being able to rack focus and um, play with not only the, the, the movement of the camera, the shutter speed and the focus, you're, you're, you're telling a story just with those three things right there. And um, my ability to do that is something that I've just honed and something that I trust. You know, I, I trust that process and I, I trust myself and I trust what I capture because I'm essentially going to be editing it and I know what I need at, the, at the, any given moment. So the reason that I use that is for speed, really, and, and to tell a story. Um, but I don't have to like rehearse and, okay, well, hold on, let me get my markers. Okay, stand in your mark. Oh, he wasn't on his mark and all this stuff where <laughs> most of the time when you're shooting any sort of content, you don't have time. You know, you're always pressed for time. So. If I, if I can be faster in any way and still get the shot or the product that I need, I'm gonna take that. To be honest, I don't even know most of the time which way is what, as far as, oh, if they're farther away, go left. If they're closer, go right. I don't even know those things. I just grab it and instinctively know what to do. You know, I, I'm not a guy who's really into like specs and techniques and when it comes to filmmaking, I grab the camera and I go and I learn and I've learned the entire time, my entire life. I've, I've never been a creator that just sat and watched as a process of learning. I, I just jumped into it and I think that's the best technique. Grab the camera and learn. Learn what works best for you because what works best for you might not be what works best for me and vice versa. So for me to tell you some techniques that may not be resourceful to you uh, is a waste of my breath and uh, your time. So grab the camera. In that time spent listening to my top five, uh, you can grab a, grab a lens and a camera and, and start messing around. Great question. How do I meet deadlines when I'm in a creative block? You have a job to do. That's something that needs to be you know, first and foremost, you are a work for hire, which in my mind makes you no different than any other sort of freelance work. I mean, the, your landscaping, a painter, those guys don't get into creative blocks. They, they deliver on time when they need to. They're, that's how they consistently get work. And if they weren't, if, if the landscaper was like, oh, I, I, you know, I, I can't come today, I'm, I have a creative block. I don't know how to trim the weeds. I mean, would you hire the guy again? Probably not. You as an artist have to find the, the ability and the resilience and the problem solving to at least make it through that project. And then once you make it through that project and meet that deadline, and if you need an extension or you need some time, tell them as soon as possible, as soon as you know, even if it's the day after you get the project, hey, I'm gonna need a couple more days on this. I know I said the 17th, but it's gonna be the 19th. Whatever the case may be, keep the communication open. Essentially, you have to kind of take your artist side out of it, understand what the job is, is this a job that I'm just gonna have to do and 
take the artist side out of it, and if, if so, then you don't have a creative block. You just deliver what you need to deliver. And if it's a project where you're going to be more artistic and more filmmaker based, then those are the projects that probably don't come with huge budgets and probably don't come with huge deadlines. So you have to understand what project is which. And um, I know a lot of times we're artists, so we're going to have our artist side even on jobs. And that's kind of where the creative block comes in because you want to create something creative, but it's a job. It's not a creative job. And that's kind of where the, the two personalities clash. So we have to have that understanding and it's, it's hard for everybody. It's not easier for me than it is for, for the next person. So just determining what the job is and, um, and, and communicating with your client are, are two things that will help you tremendously.